Hey guys, welcome back. Today is my third installment of cooking my way through this depression era recipes cookbook. So going into the why of why I'm doing this, I haven't really mentioned this before, but Julie and Julia is one of my favorite movies and it has always been a goal of mine to cook my way through a cookbook. Now, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to cook through every single recipe in this cookbook, but I will try to cook through as many as I can just for my own personal experimentation and because I enjoy it. So with that being said, let's hop into recipe number one. So the first recipe I'm gonna be trying is for a Spanish omelet, and this calls for two tablespoons of butter, two large onions, two buttons of garlic, one half to one pint of tomatoes, specifies a pint of tomatoes, makes me feel like they are canned, and so that's what I got. A dash of red pepper, two to three small chilies, I went with jalapenos, and then salt and six eggs. In preparation to make this Spanish omelet, I diced two large onions. Now, I'll admit that this was a lot of onion, which leads me to believe that over the course of 90 years of agricultural development or so, what's considered a large onion now is probably different than it was back then. It was also common practice to save the skins for making broth or stock. I minced my two cloves of garlic, I seeded and diced my jalapenos, and I scrambled my six eggs. Over on the skillet, I melted two tablespoons of butter and added in my onions. Now the recipe says to brown the onions, which I interpreted to mean caramelize them. So I set a 30 minute timer and I let my onions cook on medium to medium low heat, stirring every now and then until they were caramelized. And caramelizing them does cause them to shrink down quite a bit, but it was still a lot of onion. I added in my garlic and cooked this for a minute more until it was fragrant. Then I added in my diced jalapenos, half a can of diced tomatoes, a dash of cayenne pepper, season with salt to taste and let this cook together for a few minutes. I poured over my eggs and covered with a lid. I don't actually have a lid that fits this particular skillet and I let this cook until the tops of the eggs were set. The instructions say to fold it, but I could already tell that this was too thick to fold. I probably would have needed to use my larger skillet for it to be foldable, but that's okay. Mine was more like a frittata than an omelet. I flipped it over onto a cutting board since it was so thick and it didn't stick to the skillet at all because there were so many vegetables coating the bottom. I did lose a couple of veggies, but I just spooned them back on top. I cut this into eight slices and it was ready to serve. So this is one of those situations where I don't really see how this can be bad. It's caramelized onions, it's jalapenos, garlic, and it is more of a frittata than an omelet for sure. For the amount of veggies that were in this, I feel like I could have doubled up on the eggs, maybe just baked it into a casserole. That is super good though. There is so many veggies in this that I can hardly taste the eggs. It almost feels like eggs topped with just a bunch of pico de gallo. That would probably be my best way to explain this, except for it's a little bit sweet from the caramelized onion. I scrambled up the rest of it and put it in some meal prep containers. I'm gonna use this as a veggie packed burrito filling most likely. Moving on to the next recipe, which is a beverage. We are making the best ever lemonade. For this, you need four lemons, one cup of sugar, and one quart of water. The reason I wanted to try this lemonade was because of its unique preparation method, which actually makes a lot of sense, but I've just never heard of it being done this way. The first step is to peel the lemons because we're using the rind and the juice separately. I did try a couple of different methods with this. On my first attempt, I peeled the lemon first, and then I tried to use my citrus juicer to juice the lemon, but without the rind attached, it wasn't very good at getting all of the juice out of the lemon. So I did end up pressing the juice through a strainer manually with a spoon, and the second lemon, I thought maybe I'd try juicing the lemon first and then peel off the rind, but I ended up just snapping my citrus juicer. So in the end, I went back to peeling them first and then manually juicing them. In a bowl with the rinds, I added one cup of sugar and gave that a quick toss. Letting the sugar sit on the rinds will make lemon infused sugar, essentially. And that's what I thought was so interesting about this recipe. It says to let it stand for half an hour, but I'm sure you could let it stand for longer if you wanted a stronger flavor. I boiled my quart of water and poured it over the top of the lemon, rind, and sugar mixture. It barely fit in the bowl, but it did indeed fit. Gave it a quick stir and then I set it aside to cool. This is a lot of waiting, but I feel like it's a fairly efficient method of making lemonade with just a few lemons. And once it's cooled, add it to a pitcher with your strained lemon juice, let it chill, and then it's ready to serve. I chilled it overnight, so I'll actually have to review it a little bit later in the video. So I hope you can tell by now that all of these recipes take a lot of time to prepare and a lot of planning in advance. I still have several recipes that I want to make and some of them take up to eight hours to prepare from start to finish. So I do wanna make something that's kind of quick and I'm intrigued by it. And that is the tomatoes with mayonnaise. Now, I am from the South. 
and I love a good tomato sandwich. For me, a tomato sandwich is two slices of toast, a few slices of tomatoes, a good hefty amount of mayonnaise, salt, and pepper. Now what's intriguing about this recipe is that it calls for tomatoes, mayonnaise, and sugar. And it says to peel the tomatoes and cut in half, put about two tablespoons of mayonnaise on top of each one, sprinkle with about one teaspoon of sugar. That's it and it's very good. That feels like so much mayonnaise and so much sugar, but I mean, it is a big hunk of tomato with half a tomato, so maybe it's not so much, but the things I do for the internet. Let's give it a try. I like it. <laughs> I actually really like it. It's kind of like coleslaw dressing in a way, like, you know, the sugar with the mayonnaise combination tastes a lot like coleslaw, but it's with tomato instead of cabbage. And honestly, I really like it. <laughs> so for tomorrow's dinner, I'm going to be making the poor man's soup, but that does require some preparation in advance. So I'm gonna be starting some of these steps tonight and then having it for dinner tomorrow. To make the poor man's soup, we need soup bones, pea beans or navy beans, tomatoes, celery, potatoes, rice, ground beef, onion, basil, salt and pepper. The night before I sorted and soaked my navy beans, I like to do this a little at a time on a plate. You're looking for stones or pebbles, but I also like to remove any dark or dry beans just to make sure I don't overlook a pebble by mistake. Then I put them in a bowl and cover them with water and let them soak overnight. Early the next morning, I started simmering my soup bones. The recipe calls for eight quarts of water to one soup bone. I started this in my Dutch oven, which only holds four quarts of water. I did bring the soup bones up to a boil and then I skimmed off any foam from the top. I then remembered that I do have a larger pot that would hold all eight quarts, so I transferred everything over. The only issue with this pot is that it doesn't have a lid, so usually I just cover it with aluminum foil or a pizza pan. The longer you can simmer the bones, the better. Sometimes I even like to do this overnight for up to 18 hours, but I'm kind of sensitive to scents, so sometimes when I do that, the smell will keep me up at night, so I don't typically do that very often. On this day, I boiled the bones for about six hours, and if you want a richer flavor and color, you can even roast the bones in the oven prior to making the stock. Every so often, I'd skim off the layer of fat that floats to the top, and this can be cooled and used as cooking oil if desired. Once you're happy with your stock, remove the bones and strain off any meaty bits that are floating around. Rinse and drain your navy beans and add those into your stock and allow this to simmer for 45 minutes. In the meantime, we can prep all of our veggies. I peeled and diced a small onion, chopped three stalks of celery, and peeled and diced two potatoes. In a moment, I'll share how I use the potato skins as well. I browned and crumbled one third a pound of ground beef along with one third a cup of chopped onion. I added that to my soup along with my chopped celery, potatoes, one large can of diced tomatoes, half a cup of white rice, one eighth of a teaspoon of basil, and plenty of salt and pepper. Stir this all to combine and let it simmer for one hour and then your poor man's soup is done. This is the poor man's soup, which by far took the longest of all the recipes that I made. But of course, that's just because we had to simmer our soup bones and make our own stock. And remember, if your food tastes bland, just add more salt and pepper. I added a good bit of salt and pepper because this is a pretty big batch of soup. It is without judgment what you would expect. It is a budget soup. It's a poor man's meal, which essentially means that it's a lot of very filling things. It's got rice, it's got potatoes, it's got beans in it, um, celery, tomatoes, very, very inexpensive ingredients. And then we made the broth ourselves. With these kinds of meals, they are not the most glamorous meals. They are just meant to fill you up for really cheap. This definitely hits the bill as far as that goes. I would have really enjoyed this if I had put corn in it instead of celery. Overall, it is quite a lovely bowl of soup. Now, as far as a way to utilize those potato skins, my favorite way is to fry them in some vegetable oil until they are crispy. Think of this like potato skin chips and then toss them in some salt and you have a delicious crunchy snack. We are doing the cabbage casserole, which this gives me like Polish cabbage roll vibes, but in a casserole form. For the cabbage casserole, you'll need one pound of ground meat, one onion, a can of tomato soup, a cabbage, and some rice. This one comes together fairly quickly, but has a long cook time. Start by peeling and dicing an onion, also core and chop your head of cabbage. In a skillet, brown your meat and onion together, then mix your meat and onion with your chopped cabbage, your can of tomato soup, half a can of water, one cup of rice, and season well with salt and pepper. The recipe said to mix it in a casserole dish, but I honestly didn't trust myself to do that and not make a huge mess. 
so I mixed it in a bowl and then poured it into my casserole dish. Cover and bake this at 350 degrees for two hours and that is the cabbage casserole. I would say that of most of the depression meals that I've made, this one required kind of the least amount of work because it was fairly just dump and bake. Uh, besides just browning up the meat and the onions. So if this turns out good, I might actually be putting this on my rotation because I've always loved cabbage rolls but hated the amount of work that goes into making them. I also almost forgot that I made lemonade yesterday, so we have to give that a try as well. Let's go with the lemonade first. That is perfectly sweet and tart. It is a little bit too strong for my taste. I would personally add just a splash more water. I would probably even concentrate this down like 75% lemonade, 25% water. But that's just my personal preference and I actually do that a lot with lemonades because I do find them to be just a little bit too much sometimes. Okay, let's give it a try. I don't often use the word homey to describe meals, but I would say that this is a very cozy, homey meal. It's very nice and filling and warm. You've got the pork in there, the rice. You use ground beef if you have that. Like I said, I just use pork because it's more traditional to the Polish cabbage roll, but typically I probably would have just used ground beef. Um, otherwise, I think that this is really fantastic. I'm going to enjoy eating this for my lunch today. I know it was supposed to be my dinner technically yesterday, but all of these recipes just take so much time to prepare that if you're really not planning ahead, like usually a day or two in advance, some of them can take that much time. I couldn't leave you guys without a dessert this time, so we are trying this novel layer cake. For this you need shortening, sugar, eggs, vanilla, salt, pastry flour, or in my case I'm using all-purpose flour and cornstarch, also brown sugar, chopped nuts, and cocoa powder. Cream together half a cup of shortening with one cup of sugar. I was in luck because as it turns out, the first electric hand mixer was produced and sold in the 1920s. So technically I didn't have to hand whip my egg whites last time, the things you learn. Add in two eggs and half a teaspoon of vanilla and mix this to combine. Then sift in one and a half cups of all purpose flour, three quarters of a teaspoon of salt and three tablespoons of cornstarch. Spread this in an even layer in the bottom of a greased baking dish. It didn't specify what size baking dish, so I used nine by nine, but I believe I should have used a nine by 13. For the second layer, whip one egg white until it's stiff, then fold in one cup of brown sugar and one tablespoon of cocoa powder. Gently stir in a half a teaspoon of vanilla and spread this evenly over the first layer. Sprinkle it with your chopped walnuts and bake at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. Mine still seemed a little underdone in the center, but I was pretty tired at this point, so I just decided it was fine. Absolutely, this is one of the most unique desserts that I have ever prepared, and I'm very excited. It almost seems like it's a cake topped with a meringue, almost like the meringue topping like made its own like caramel sauce on the inside. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it's going to taste, but the inside is still a little on the raw side, but I did grab some pieces from there around the outer edge, so should be fine. Let's give it a try. I am desperately trying to figure out how to describe this dessert because it is unlike anything I've ever had before. It is incredibly sweet. For me personally, it is too sweet. There's just too much going on in here, but the texture is almost like that of a shortbread cookie. And then it's got this kind of chocolate, crispy, marshmallow-ish topping. That's probably the best way to explain it. It's like a shortbread cookie topped with a crispy chocolate marshmallow. Very sweet. Delicious though. And like the texture of this is unlike anything I've ever had before. And I'm honestly in love with this dessert. It is fantastic. I hope you guys enjoyed this round of trying depression era recipes. I had a lot of fun with it. I definitely found some new favorites, some surprising ones like the tomatoes with mayonnaise and sugar. I definitely like the lemonade. I feel like there's a lot of things that I take away from these videos every time I do them and things I take away from the recipes every time I make them. Like those crispy potato skins will now be a staple for me anytime I need to peel potatoes. But otherwise, I hope you all enjoyed this video. I hope you're having a fantastic day and I will see you again soon.